Thank you so much for all of you for being here tonight. Um, let's have some fun first. I have a poem for all of you, well, in particular my friend Andrew at the very back. This is a poem that takes place right here in Arizona, Tempe, Phoenix area, and it's called The Penis Couch in the Middle of Phoenix, Arizona. The Penis Couch in the Middle of Phoenix, Arizona. If I was ordering room service right now, I'd definitely get the lobster ravioli and a glass of vino verde, which is pretty good for hotel food, but not good enough for a last meal on earth. And it's strange to think about Henry Hargraves photographing death row criminals, final meals, the finale of their food journeys on this planet, the artist's recreation, John Wayne Gancy's order of original recipe, KFC and fries and fried shrimp and strawberries, and yes, that's really the way to live, only no. And what about Victor? Ferger's request of a single olive with pit inside, hope of the olive tree growing in the body, a peace offering, if he was even trying to make a statement. And Eileen Warnos, Eileen Warnos, who only requested a cup of black coffee, probably thinking, what the hell, I won't be needing any cream and sugar on the other side. Unlike Timothy McVeigh and his two pints of mint chocolate chip ice cream, because hey, deep down we all really want to eat what we want. The way Ronnie Lee Gardner ordered lobster tail and steak and apple pie a la mode with a movie marathon, and can anyone really let go of the ending, the start of beautiful friendships, the rain falling as lovers reunite, Lassie returns home, Frank Sinatra settles down, the cast sings the closing number in this golden age of Hollywood, Tanner the Lion Roars, joyous spectacle of life, take off your gold top hat, and one night in Phoenix, my friend Andrew and I spend what feels like hours looking for this underground speakeasy that projects images from criminals' lives onto the circle lantern above the circular bar, a secret restaurant inside, and wanted posters and memorabilia, and before entering through the back alley, a couple of steps back before the night actually begins, we encounter a penis-shaped couch right in the middle of the quiet city, and I think, oh, this spectacle of life is saying good morning to you right in front of me, and if I had a couple of thousand dollars to spare, I'd bring that baby right home because it's art that makes me stop because don't worry, honey, I'll put it in the living room and we'll feast like there's no tomorrow, two bourbons, neat, and caviar and pate, and we'll talk about it all until the sun rises, until it rises and sets again, rises and sets again, and damn, you look good. Thank you again all for being here tonight. Uh, thank you again, Elliot, for that beautiful introduction. It's very great meeting you tonight, and I'm honestly really flattered with your analysis of my work, so thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you. Thank you in particular to ASU Piper Center and ASU English for hosting me and Dana. Dana, another round of applause for Dana first. Dana, it's such an honor to read with you and like reunite after a couple of years of like not seeing each other. And also thank you in particular to Justin at the very back. Round of applause for Justin for having us, hosting us, making this event very, very special to Kalani and Angie at the Piper House, to Tara, Sally, our faculty, and of course, I have to have a special thank you to my poetry dad, Norman Duby. Thank you for always believing in me. Okay, here's a couple new poems uh, from the new book, Revenge of the Asian Woman. Triple sonnet for Asian girls eating gelato. My parents want me to marry a nice Chinese boy, and I just want to be pushed against the wall outside the gallery of a five-star hotel, and oh, what a compromising position in black-winged liner and red glossed-up lips, and who doesn't think kissing is the greatest thing on earth other than eating, or maybe it's the other way around, and sure, I'll settle for the rosemary potatoes and lobster wellington after the sex, and really, whatever happened to raw appeal and romance novel passion, and put me on the cover now, breasts exposed, a hand reaching down my blouse, the stuff of dreams, of middle of the night cravings. Like when I look at plates of gelato, those beautiful messes of biscotti thrown into marzipan Italian ice cream, and those beautiful messes of strawberry, and those beautiful messes drizzled on strawberry cream. And yes, yes, a little messy is always a good thing. Like getting lipstick all over a guy's face, the way chocolates are named after public displays of affection. And my parents want me to marry a nice Chinese boy, but what 
what's the fun in arrangement? And sometimes I do wonder if there's a hidden guy for me somewhere in Hong Kong, my parents waiting to debut at family dinner, and that thought's just a little scary. Where's the passion? Where's the pirate wrench book cover? Where's the middle of the night fridge raids of ice cubes on his chest and honey on your knees feeding each other cherries? And it's sexy when things are a surprise, a present, a lavender macaroon wrapped up in a tiny box, or the way a lover smiles at you so tenderly once the act is over, and you wonder, and it's sexy when things are a surprise, like learning each other's favorite foods or fantasizing in bed about what you'll both eat next, the spicy ramen and rare burgers, and oh, those messy piles of gelato mixed with soft kisses never stop feeding me. Baby, I'm hungry already, already, already. So one of my favorite movies is um, St. Elmo's Fire. How many of you have seen that? Maybe, okay, perfect, okay, there's not too much of a gap. Okay, so in that movie, um, my favorite character is Andrew McCarthy's character because he plays Kevin, the writer. And remember, he's the guy who keeps saying, oh, what's like the uh, meaning of life? What's the point of life? And I just admire him so, so much because he's like the only fuckable writer in history because he actually makes money and he lands on the front page of a newspaper on his first try, so he's timeless. So. This is for him. Um, Ode to Andrew McCarthy and your hand on my thigh. If I want a game show, I'd adopt a panda. It's the best pickup line I've heard in my life because it's not a line or a joke or a story recounted at a party where they're out of chips. And who even makes punch for parties anymore except in the movies? And if movies are the guide to life where we learn how to kiss, how to smoke a cigar, how to tempt a lover in a red Corvette, LA, 3 a.m., the wind in your hair, down to your breasts, braless, under a low V dress, stroking the driver who's also your lover, he relents, stops the car, the motorcycle circling around you because this is young love and everyone, Everyone must make way, and there's so many lights, and maybe we're not listening to the movies enough because we're not in a convertible in LA, a young Andrew McCarthy stroking my thigh. No, it's Christmas morning, not thinking about what comes next. Speaking of which, I'd marry that man who said, if I won a game show, I'd adopt a panda. No hesitation, travel to Chengdu with him or Ocean Park Amusement Park, Hong Kong, home to Ying Ying and Li Li, and tourists and locals supply them with an endless count of cardboard to rip, which is like a game show. The gro grocery cart runs. You win a lifetime supply of Blue Moon ice cream or hot dogs and say hello to wiener bits in your mac and cheese for lunch for the whole next year. And what about those babes and sparkly dresses? The glitz and the glamour of spinning that wheel, letting it determine your entire fate, hoping you'll land on the boat or the trip to Paris, letting it determine your fate. And maybe what I want isn't the real life pandas, but the things I really cannot have. The things out of this world, no, not UFOs or the chocolate martinis on Mars, but that feeling, like how one night in Tallahassee, I chant my dead dog's name, Buzzy, 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 over and over, and I feel him sleeping next to me on bed. And you've got to admit, some creatures really are irreplaceable, and the once in the blue moon nightly visits aren't enough. And I think about Andrew McCarthy and Mannequin, how Kim Cattrall just comes to life for his eyes only, and he wants to keep holding on to every moment, and maybe we do spend four, more hours of the day looking at someone than we do listening to them, but what's the point if we can't feel their soft skin on our hands every day, and can I just keep holding on? As I mentioned um, earlier at the Piper Center, and thank you for all of you who attended, um, I write a lot about my heritage. And a big part of my heritage that's a really fun part is the Chinese zodiac. I let the Chinese zodiac guide me, and of course I take it with a grain of salt, but ever since I was a little girl growing up in Allentown, Pennsylvania, I'd have like um, holiday trips and several like weekend trips to uh, the Chinatowns in both New York City and Philadelphia. And um, during the new year, my dad and I would always go to the bookstore and he'd buy his annual fortune telling books and he'd always read them to me. And um, I'm the year of the snake, so I reflect a lot on that. The Chinese Zodiac Snake Cocktail. According to the Chinese Zodiac, snake and rat meet at a bar. 
and she slithers away sipping something a little smoky, a little sexy, a little jalapeno mixed with tequila because light my fire, baby, light my fire, she's thinking, ready to devour the rat man whole. And the snake woman's a seductress, fire embodied the face and body that launched a million ships into the night, that oversexed little human being who really means no harm, unlike Eve, serpent of the candied apple. But really, who wouldn't have been seduced by that creature so long and graceful, so long and graceful? Well, baristas had to name a coffee after her, the snake in the grass made of mint and mocha and a shot of espresso. Ice me, baby, ice me. And what about that cocktail of gin and vermouth and lemon and ice and let her sneak up on you? And why don't you imagine you're stuck in the sheets, a boa constrictor slithering up your way and would you brush her off? And you've got to admit that even if you're terrified, you're at least a little bit turned on. And the snake woman is a seductress, ready to swallow the rat man whole. And he loves how she's wise, good with money, a little arrogant, and in Chinese culture, if you're caught a snake, it's a real compliment. A good eye, the cunning to succeed, almond eyes, and I learned this when I'm six, stunned facing a yellow snake caged up in a pet store in Pennsylvania, and when I go home, my father reads me a fortune, tells me I'm a snake. And when I'm 14, losing my temper, my mother tells me about the family fortune teller visits before I was born, how he warned my parents about my temper. If I lost it too often, too much, I'd end up a housewife with two children. And in that moment at 14, I want to cry at my kitchen table. But my mother tells me in every case, I marry a handsome man, live happily ever after, and I'm not romantic. But that fairy tales carry me through adulthood. The way I think about the animals of the zodiac and the Snake woman's a seductress, ready to eat the rat hole, and she's compatible with roosters and oxen, but rabbits are too much sex for too little time. But there's just something about a snake and a rat playing cat and mouse at a bar, how she slithers away, he's intrigued. She's hard to read, she swallows him whole, and they forget about everyone and everything in the world in the scene of tension you could cut with a knife. And it's sexy, the way she wraps herself around him. And the rest is history. And if the fortune teller is right, I can hardly wait to swallow my rat hole. Here's the opening poem of Attack of the 50-Foot Centerfold. A little bit uh, more family history. My father is the son of a concubine. My father is the son of a concubine. It's crazy how much cleavage the concubines on the hot new Hong Kong soap are showing. And my mother hates it, but what's not to love? Gorgeous women of whatever century, Imperial China sporting dragonfly patterns on silk while they brush their hair, their transfer of bedroom politics into the let's play dirty scheme and couture takeover the mainland eat up our husbands and all their wives in one episode. And if life is made of episodes, then what about the one when my friend tells me I was a concubine in a past life? I'm sure I was at the top of a food chain, racking up bills, bills, bills on an emperor tycoon's credit card, forming alliances with the right women, only to knock one out each week, clawing my way to the top, stabbing him in the back, and making myself queen of the world, empress of everyone's hearts. And with the word concubine, I think of my father, born to a concubine. No, not a royal one, more like a second wife, to a grandfather I've only met once. And at six, I ask dad why he has a half-brother and half-sister. Mom interrupts, telling me my grandparents divorced early, but I don't believe her because at nine, dad is driving us from Allentown to New York to meet his father. And I think, what's the emperor doing in Flushing? It's Chinese New Year, and for once, we're celebrating with my dad's side. But we're in the restaurant. We sit the farthest away from my grandfather, who, two, who three quarters of the way into dinner gives me a red envelope. And on the drive home, mom opens it. Dorothy got 50. That's not bad, dad says. Her cousin's got 700. He keeps driving, and I never see this grandfather again. More family history. My parents' love story, the dinner special. The roasted pig's head of Kowloon Market stares back at me, mouth wide open, as my grandmother picks out some fat ass pork for dinner, and I swing the bag of cherries and lychees as grandma says, no, not that piece, that one. 
And I love how she's such a boss, letting the world know what a carnivore she is as I look at the women across the street in tight red dresses and stilettos handing out beer flyers, or the parallel universe next door of beauties in skimpy green Santa suits passing out sakiets as they gesture to the winding staircases upstairs in the apartments above, and I want to shield my grandmother from such a sight. But who am I kidding? She's already seen it all, and she moves on to duck gizzards as the butcher handles this beauty of the long neck goose. And yes, grandma's seen it all, from old school Hong Kong of businessmen meeting their paid dates at dessert shops during after hours of children rushing home. So their parents waiting on the boring streets doorsteps to the day she realized my 18-year-old mother was in love with my father, 32. Their family's perpetual dinner guest, two years widowed, chowing down a bowl of grandfather's noodles, my mom barely eating, staring at my dad. And what girl hits the jackpot and marries her teenage crush? And what girl actually hits the jackpot and marries her teenage crush? He's not invited to dinner the next night, so mom sneaks up to grab a Big Mac with him, and they share french fries, dipping them in soft serve. The people at the Nick's booth staring because of the food, because of the chemistry, and the rest is history and me. I write a lot about food. My buzzwords are food and sex, so here's another one. Ode to all my flings who have hated dim sum. Ode to all my flings who have hated dim sum, and they're missing out every time I order a sampler platter of hagao shumai chrysanthemum jelly and the Chinese version of ravioli because the Italians stole all their recipes from East Asia. God damn you, Marco Polo. And I'm sure none of these guys get it. They've called me an adventurous eater as I spit out the bones from my chicken's feet bathing in porridge, though my grandmother orders the same dish every morning in Kowloon. And these men can't handle the truth that this isn't bizarre foods for me, and my father, who who's given me everything, grew up eating moldy bread as he looked out the window, writing down the license plates of the cars that drove past, and made a boat that floated out of cardboard that sailed him to the US. Or what about my mother, who only dreamed of dolls with glass eyes and yogurt in her fridge while her sister saved up their coins for the snack stand outside their family apartment? All my mother ever wanted was a pair of Levi's, light wash, and red stockings for fancy nights. And no, white boy, you can't handle my food, you can't handle me, and I'm not your Asian cupcake, your Chinese wet dream in a slit, red slip, and pink kimono. I'm not your stuffed panda that dances when you poke my button. Though you say I have the softest skin in the world, well, it's sandpaper once I open my mouth. A bit of a transition here, so I'm gonna to move to the middle section of my book, which is um, a whole sonnet sequence called Chinatown Sonnets, which is also my chapbook book out with New Delta Review. And um, continuing on this food theme and also a family history lesson, here's sonnet number four, which is titled At the Seafood Market. In this fish head soup sonnet, I helped my mom pick out a fatty fish at the market. Big, scary fish sleeves had purses his lips, giving me red eye glare. That bloody stare reminds me that I hate eye contact. As the sexy eels out dare each other to touch this hunchback of the market fish squirming, his head is the size of six patties greased together, squished. Seafood nightmare feel. He's king of the dead fish, but mom, but mom finds him perfect. Put him in soup, we'll use his head for broth. We'll add in some scallops and clams, some frog legs on the side, and shrimps with heads. We go by him. I won't touch his head. And another one. Number nine, the Times Square of Asia. My cousin and I search for the best street food. She's obsessed with American waffles, egg-shaped, gaidanzai, made in a griddle, Hong Kong snack that's rounded, not checkered. We wait in a line as long as a mile. They're the craze that's never going away, along with the curried fish balls on a skewer with curried squid or mini sausages. And how cute you are, Hong Kong. Just how special, I think, as we get our waffles, walk through Mong Kok, the Times Square of East Asia, how I want to adopt all the puppies in the windows, buy all these cheap clothes, counterfeiting European runways. 10. Vintage shopping with grandpa. 
Grandpa knows European fashion. He bargains for a Louis Vuitton at a vintage store, a white belt I've been eyeing for years. His haggling brings me back to childhood, age four when he picked me up from school, take me shopping at a dollar store, buy me a toy turtle aquarium, a snowman painting, then some snacks off to groceries, unwrapping snowball ice creams on a tray, coconut flakes covering dipped in jelly. Grandpa stocks his fridge with Coca-Cola for me, oranges for the ancestors. He hasn't been to Dim Sa Joy in years. Everything he wants is right by his Barca lounger. Fifteen, Hong Kong Rococo, which has an epigraph from Casablanca, will always have Paris. My uncle tries his best take on Paris. His apartment with fake crystals in cases, clouds on the ceiling, with chandelier, rococo rotary phone, elegant 18th century in the middle of Hong Kong. The couch is a French blue. I sit there eating corn on the cob and cheese bread, gazing at the clouds. This Asian obsession with France. Take the Japanese with Paris syndrome. The couple wants the Rose of Versailles, Marie Antoinette's cottage and castle, but they're entering our century, a gritty France. They return home sad. It's not the fancy Paris scene in ads. The Japanese embassy steps in. And that is a real thing in that a lot of Japanese tourists who go to France become very disappointed because it's not the thing of their fantasies. Another transition, but kind of just as kitschy, I'm going to um, read a poem that is related to the cover image of my book. It's actually the title poem of the book. And during my MFA here at Arizona State, I took a persona poem class with the wonderful Janice Savard, and she introduced me to the persona poem, and I had a lot of fun with it. I remember the first class we were in, she told us to write about, write in a persona that isn't us, so I chose the voices of Playboy centerfolds. Thought it'd be an interesting project, and here's one of the results of this, also the title poem. Attack of the 50-foot centerfold with the killer legs. Attack of the centerfold in technicolor and again in 3D. My long legs challenging you boulevard by boulevard, smashing everything, then eating a donut shop, guzzling it all down with carrot juice and tequila muddled with blackberries. Because this is LA and women will have it all. Give me a thousand fish tacos and cupcakes and all the sushi hot dogs and hibashi filet. Bring me a man, no make it a hundred, blonde and ripped as West Hollywood gym bunnies, eating bananas in front of me, making eye contact the entire time. Because King Kong only needed Faye, but a woman like me needs 100 men while I take up an entire pool in Bel-Air. Air, and the butler takes the town car and buys me towels while I drink shots of champagne out of buckets. And my men run to Frederick's to pick up the first ever double D, double Z cup bra with matching black lace panties because I've been nude this whole time and I know you love it so stop looking. While the rest of the men make me croque monsieurs because it's their turn to be in the kitchen and I want my cheese melted in Swiss. So what does this centerfold have left to do? Godzilla needed a building but I'll take a billboard, knock it down, let some cars roller coaster down my legs then return home, sit for a royal portrait by the pool as the photographer tells me to take the double Z off and he freezes. And my men come by with buckets, pour the champagne down my body, and I dare 10 of them to lick me. But they freeze at my womanhood so much that I'll just have to share myself with the world as the cars stop and stare me down Hollywood Boulevard as the cops stop and stare at me down Hollywood Boulevard all the way to the beach, if there even is still a beach. Nude Christmas in Italian restaurant fantasy. It's the holidays, and I'm sending nude photos to a guy who's talking about fantasies, how in a restaurant he'd throw a bottle of Pinot right on the floor, make love to me on the table, pulling that party trick, grabbing the tablecloth from underneath as onlookers watch, taking photos, applauding like we're in some kind of experimental art display, museum goers pay $10 to watch at the MoMA, clapping again at the end because, is there any other way to react to art? You could cry, fan your face, wipe that tear off, laugh, pretend you give a damn, 
Amsterdam about this culmination of cinema, our scene of beauty that's Citizen Kane worthy in its frankness. And I tell him this is all swell, but in the next scene, let's move to the floor because as things shatter, we won't feel it because we're invincible. And I'm still hoping it's you and me in the end. And I'm still hoping it's you and me in the end. And I don't care if Alfredo gets in my hair. We're not in some cheesy rom-com pina colada getaway of Castaway's fantasy of man and woman who find each other sexy because there's no one else, even though a day ago female lead said, I wouldn't marry him if he were the last man on earth. And I tell this guy as he pages through my breast that in this fantasy, the waiter will deliver our breadsticks on the floor because food is sexier when you're craving. Take splash when Daryl Hannah's at the five star with Tom Hanks and she munches down that lobster shell included and his jaw drops because he's wondering, where has this woman been all my life? Or after an argument like in the Flintstones when Fred and Wilma suck on ribs groaning each other in the restaurant and then some lady licking her spumoni orders tiramisu for us trying to join but her hair is too comic book red and this table is reserved for two, I take her tiramisu, throw it at his chest, lick it off. Ode to nurses, love hotels, and Maryland's on the covers of Playboy. I see two nurses kissing at the gay club, their latex dresses and Florence Nightingale caps and white heels straight out of my childhood dreams of being like Hello Nurse from Animaniacs, that blonde bombshell sex goddess cartoon with cleavage stacked like bookshelves and red lips even tastier than the pizza she nibbled on in that scene when Yaku and Waku sing about her 160 plus IQ and multiple PhDs, but you know what they were really drooling over, leaving seven-year-old me to wonder what place a little Asian girl has in this world of 90s Marilyn Monroe's running in slow-mo on the beach wearing red swimsuits, their nipples perking up on prime time, or fair-skinned sex kittens on the covers of Playboy, Hustler, and whatever men and women read for the articles. Girls next door with baby faces and bare bums. While 25-year-old me thinks about getting a guy who can do both because the kissing nurses are two blonde pretty boys with just enough muscle. And oh, how every time I'm attracted to a man, I think about what he'll look like in a dress because I refuse to be the only one with feminine wiles. And it's funny how we're turned on by the simplest things, how love hotels in Japan have under the sea themed rooms and what woman wouldn't want to get fucked dressed as a mermaid and in the space station, a 70s James Bond romp in the golden sack then of course the Victorian rooms and the hot tubs surrounded by Roman pillars and the red bird cages for a little midnight dance. But what if I'd rather play doctor than nurse or teacher rather than schoolgirl or fly you rather than ride you? Or why can't we just have a go on the carousel in the middle of the fun house surrounded by carnival mirrors because I like you a little scared wrapped in my arms. And uh, my final poem, where are all the hot pilots? Thank you, Mrs. Guan, because I'm flying out tomorrow, so it's fitting. I'm four years old and a plane's flying above the Hong Kong playground when my teacher, Mrs. Swan, well, Mrs. Guan, but I'll always think of her as a swan, also known as the creature I fear the most in life. Because have you seen swans bully ducks at the zoo or chase brides down the lake eating their Vera Wang and MTV captures that moment and I can't switch the channel fast enough and maybe I've taken too many Renaissance art history classes. Zeus as glitter. Zeus as a swan, wrapping his neck around Leda's Rubenness figure, like Bjork's 73rd Academy Awards evening, where a beak that's ready to open, ready to feast, and Mrs. Guan's now beaming, pointing to the sky, you're gonna be on that plane to America soon. And she must have been so relieved, the way I'd stand up in the middle of class and stretch and eat crackers, or write my name in Chinese too large, or four-year-old date the only European boy in school, and I still remember his name, Anton, 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 and maybe I was the creature Mrs. Mrs. Guan feared the most in life, the little girl who wreaked havoc in the Hong Kong classroom. And Mrs. Guan, thank you for giving me my love of airports, which beats that Swarovski swan I give to you the day before I moved to Pennsylvania. And thank you for the afternoon you pointed at the sky because I knew just then at four I needed to escape. But airports aren't just about departures and destinations to Hawaii over the sunset like a tanning lotion ad, but arrivals 
reminding me of that short-lived 80s style dramedy featuring the woman who booked JFK Airport as her wedding venue, flights canceled and delayed, and the unlimited energy and time and money, and yes, that's excessive. And home sweet home is wherever I'm with the one I love, or home sweet home, the ceramic pineapple engraving my parents have hanging in their Vegas home, and yes, Manhattans and double wild turkeys and dirty martinis at airports are overpriced, but the more important question remains, where aren't, why aren't there any hot pilots anymore? Thank you.